Why, hello there. Thanks very much for tuning in to uh, this episode of CamCast. Uh, things are getting quite exciting now. The podcast is growing in popularity and I'm getting um, some more listeners joining. So thank you to, um, to all of you uh, for your support. Uh, don't forget to uh, tell your friends, subscribe, um, rate the podcast on Apple uh, Podcasts app, do whatever you need to do. Um, and maybe if I get enough support, uh, I might actually buy a proper webcam and a microphone uh, so that I don't sound like I'm recording this underwater. Anyway, um, my guest today is a, a lady called Snijana. She has um, a, a page on VK, which is all about um, CAE and CPE preparation. Um, so whether you need, um, you know, word transformation exercises, vocab, grammar, use of English, whatever you need, uh, snijana has got you covered. So if you are preparing for CAE or indeed CPE, or if you're just one of those freaks who likes to do um, exercises for no reason, then um, you definitely need to go and check her page out. Description um, will have a link to her page. So um, if you could go and show her your support to her, that would be much appreciated. And by the way, if you are one of those freaks who likes to do exercises for no reason, then uh, my respects to you. Um, okay, so without further ado, here is Snijana. <laughs> Three, two, one, and hello. Snijana, hello. Hello, yeah. So nice to see you here. Yeah, nice to meet you. So, um, Snijana, for our people listening uh, slash watching, just uh, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. You're an English teacher, obviously, but you also have um, a page on VK. So do you want to go ahead and tell people what it's called, where they can find it, and about your content? Oh, okay. So uh, first, thanks for inviting. Uh, it's uh, like the first time I've been interviewed and truth to be told, I'm a little bit on edge, but I think so. <laughs> Everything will be all right. Uh, so yeah, I'm a teacher now, but uh, truth to be told, I used to be a lawyer and I used yeah. to work even as a lawyer some time ago. Uh, but there was a moment when just it dawned on me that it's not for me. And that's why I decided to change uh, the field and yeah, to become a teacher. Uh, and I've been a teacher like for about three years already. And um, yeah, I'm preparing for CPE now, but uh, I've been learning English for like about 15 years already. And yeah, mm -hmm. just like a year ago, I set my heart and CPE exam. And that's what, that was the moment when I just made the group. And yeah, there are not many participants now, but actually I do not contribute that much to the group. I mean, in terms of, mo of time and efforts, but I just try to post something, something catchy, probably okay. some tricky examples, tricky words that no one has heard before. So mm -hmm. yeah, as for the link, I, I, probably you will touch it, yeah, but... But those who oh are yeah, when, when we when we release this podcast, um, I'll, I'll like do a link to your page and all of that mm -hmm. stuff, so people can go and uh, check it out. So you used to be a lawyer. That's what kind of lawyer? Mm -hmm. mm, it's like um, I even don't remember the names, but uh, like civil law. I practice civil law. It wasn't a criminal law, but yeah, I work in a big company like for about two years and. Mm -hmm. um, so you were dealing with what with like corporate law or like arbitrage or that kind of stuff corporate law yeah i also like um perform as we can see so in courts and mm -hmm. yeah and um, yeah it, it was a long time i mean the experience wasn't that long and my mother was really against the idea of quitting the job because i was mm -hmm. like a lawyer in her dreams um, and even now she's quite against what I'm doing but yeah at least I just decided that teaching is like a labor of love for me and I want to specialize in this very field yeah. a labor of love is is um is exactly right I I had a similar 
Uh, by the way, what you said about an interview, I it's not really an interview, it's more like a conversation, so don't worry about the people watching. The people. <laughs> just it's not a job interview yeah. after all, yeah. <laughs> it's just a regular a kitchen conversation, as, uh, as you say in Russian. Um, I had a similar dilemma when I, so I used to teach full time, uh, I used to work in a language school in uh, Juni. Um, and when I left Russia in 2000, 2018, 2019 really, it was the end of 2018, um, I, I had this big uh, teaching shaped hole in my heart. Um, I, I really miss teaching and, and that's actually one of the reasons I started my conversation club is because I just, I just missed it so much. Um, being, being surrounded every day by people who are super interested in language uh, and, and in finding out new stuff, I've taken that for granted. And then when I, you know, I'm, I, I love my, my current full-time job because I work two jobs, basically. I work in a company called Optimus and I work in sales and marketing, which is, which is great. And they pay me a lot of money, which is, which is nice, but it's not, it's not quite the same as teaching. Um, I'm, I'm not surrounded by people who are curious to find out new stuff like I always am and like I'm sure you are as, as a fellow linguist. Um, so what, what was it that, that just clicked one day in your brain and, and you realised, I want to be a teacher or I want to do something connected with, with language or with English? Why, why did you suddenly realise that? I think it was like a coincidence, honestly. Uh, first of all, because uh, when I quit the job as a lawyer, I've, I'd never entertained the idea of becoming a teacher, but as I was trying to apply for another job as a lawyer, I needed some money. And then I just thought, oh, yeah, I speak English. And so that's probably where I can earn money. Mm. I found one student and I, I thought that it wouldn't last that long because still I was attending those kind of interviews. Yeah, I found a student. I remember it was my first student and just harking uh, back, I would say that it was a complete disaster because I had no knowledge uh, in terms of all methodology and all this stuff. Yeah, and just then I found another student and still I couldn't apply for the job because uh, the process was quite complicated. Although I um, just uh, was interviewed many, many times, I never would any offer and I really wondered why. So probably just God who helped me or uh, like that moment and maybe just got thought that, yeah, lawyer is not for you. So probably you would better switch, uh, sh shift to, to teaching. And then I found another student and I had like four or five students and I thought that, okay, probably that's not a bad idea, yeah, like teaching, to, to teach people. And so that's when, yeah, when I uh, just thought maybe one year of teaching would be enough and then probably like in, in a year, I just can come back to lore and yeah. Uh, but uh, in a year, I just realized that yeah, I like I like doing that, and probably that's what really start, strikes a chord with me. I mean, like I really do this job, the profession, and especially I like teaching our uh, adults. Mm. Um, and so now that's what I basically do. But I, I think it wasn't like a plan. It's it wasn't something that that's a really plan. Yeah, it was just something that like it's like a ball from the blue for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, this it's you know it really resonates with me what you're saying. Um, it, it is definitely a labour of love, and you, you can definitely tell I think when you're in someone's class um, where you know where, where the teacher is, is just going through the motions. It's just their nine to five job, as opposed to someone who just genuinely loves what they're doing. Um, I've always considered myself quite lucky in in that regard um, because from a very young age. I, I didn't need to wonder, you know, what's my calling? What's my passion in life? I just knew languages. There, there was never a second of doubt in my mind, right from about the age of 13, when I started to realize that I had a, you know, a natural um, inclination towards languages. Um, but haven't you ever thought of just changing your job completely and becoming just a teacher or so what? Or it was more just an issue related to money? Um, it, was, it was more an issue of moving away from Russia because obviously now mm -hmm. I'm now I'm based in the UK permanently. Um, 
it, there's not really I mean you, you can't really make a good living as an English teacher here it's not mm. really possible mm -hmm. um, there's no market for it um, and you know I had like looked at the idea of maybe working for um, an English language school here or maybe um, starting up my own school but um, it's just it, you know absolute pennies that you that you can mm. that you can make um, and you can like get a job as like a traveling IELTS examiner or a traveling Cambridge examiner but really um, it's you might as well just get a job at McDonald's it's almost minimum wage because mm. there, there's just no market for it here um, what there is a market for is things like Cambridge Academy, things like English First, where it's normally like, you know, teenagers or, or younger adult people will come over from Russia, from, you know, Europe, from Saudi Arabia, wherever they come over from and spend a summer here or do like an intensive course. That's quite a popular thing. But obviously, you know, get, getting a job at those places is very seasonal. You know, you get a job over the summer and, and that's really it. And that's not really what I was looking for. I was looking some, for something which, you know, had career growth. That's another dirty secret of the, the English teaching world is career growth. If, you know, you, you can get up to what, director of studies? Okay, not bad. Uh, and then either you set up your own school or you, you, you branch out online and you start a speaking club or a, a CPE page or a podcast or something, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, or if you change jobs, you're basically, it's in the UK, certainly, if you, you know, say, hi, I've got five and a half years of teaching experience, teaching management, all, all of that stuff, um, that they'll just say, okay, <laughs> you're, you're just like someone fresh out of university, as far as we're concerned, it's just not really considered transferable skills. Um, having said that, the, the, you know, where I work at the moment, we work with schools, with my, I work for an educational consultancy company. Um, so my background in education, especially with international schools, because we work a lot with international schools in my company, um, that you know was quite good experience as far as they're concerned. And I was lucky enough to be able to um, you know, land, land a nice job in, in, in this company. Um, okay, so you say that obviously, you know, teaching you very much discovered is, is your calling, um, is your um, labor of love, as, as you put it. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of your favorite things to teach? Because we all have favorite and least favorite topics, right? Yeah. So uh, if we're speaking about the skills, I definitely like teaching speaking. And uh, I even uh, organize some marathons to probably um, so those who probably tell me page will just get familiar with, with, with them and uh, here I organize speaking sessions um, and the mar marathon itself wasn't only about speaking sessions so I provided uh, lots of vocabulary and every just week we met in order to practice it put this vocabulary into practice so it was devoted to particular topics like ranging from environmental issues to crimes and so on and yeah I really was into speaking I like our uh, coming off of different activities and yeah so mm -hmm. I think um, that's yeah, where I would like probably even to specialize in further and uh, the thing that I probably like many of you <laughs> detest even is writing. Also now I somehow try to get accustomed a little bit to it. Yeah, but still that sometimes it can be too challenging for me because not always can you realize what is actually required in terms of writing and especially when you teach like our C, C students or FC students, yeah, you have to uh, deal with all those criteria yeah, and so I think that's mm. that's the trickiest thing for me at least for now and uh, you mm. cannot always find some proper material for it so you, you can uh, come across some um, I don't know essays samples but um, yeah. uh, seldom I, do they really correspond these criteria and they give like this yeah, vivid I, example I of what what is necessary now to write yeah it's um it's, I think it's a real gap in the market. If there's anyone out there listening to this podcast who uh, is an aspiring teacher or an aspiring content creator, uh, writing. Writing is what you need to do. Um, I was talking about this when, when I was just starting my, um, my speaking club. Um, I was speaking to um, 
uh, you know, an old, an old acquaintance and, and a student of mine. Uh, you, you know, Robert, don't, the guy who put us in touch, Robert Van Woyage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and, and he was saying, look, forget, forget speaking. Um, writing is what you need to focus on. If you, if you create the ultimate writing channel or the ultimate writing page on VK, you'll make so much money because there's no, there's nothing out there. There's no way. Of, and I'm just like, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, it's just so, yeah. it's what it is. It's, it's boring. It's boring to teach. Um, not necessarily boring to do. I mean, I, I like writing in my free time and I like writing, you know, posts and I like writing articles and, I, you know, just, you know, poems, just, just for myself. Um, mm -hmm, more, more, yeah, more, mostly young. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, okay, what about um, what about the big G word, grammar? Are you are you a fan of teaching grammar and vocabulary? Mm, I think it depends on the level. And uh, yeah, I was in love with grammar some time ago, but I don't know what happened then. I even uh, try to study something myself, and yeah, usually. It doesn't appeal that much. I don't know why. So my preferences, you know, have changed recently. And if, for example, for, for instance, even casting my mind back to the time when I just started teaching, I was really keen on grammar. And yeah, I just try. I, I just like to explain it. But now I'm more like are uh, into. I like self speaking. And every time, even with my low level students, you know, I just. Uh, try to speak them uh, as much as possible and there are those elementary students who come to me and they say that how can I speak uh, if I just don't know how to do that but we start with something basic and just in a week or so they just at least they can see something and that's what I probably try to develop in everyone because I think that speaking is one of the basic skills that definitely you have to acquire grammar is essential as well and you cannot speak well without knowing grammar but uh, I'm again pretty sure that you can speak without knowing everything in detail yeah and even if you make some mistakes I never do I punish my students for that I just try to encourage them and just I not always do also correct my students mm. when they make the mistakes and that's probably inspires them that instills them with some kind of confidence yeah and I think that's really what's quite quite important yeah yeah, I, I find that there's um, a sort of mirror image um, bit, um, as regards the, the two extremes of learning. So as, as your English gets more and more competent, you start off with elementary and beginner, obviously, and then you get up to proficiency. Um, and these two extremes of the spectrum here, I find mirror each other um, when it comes to how grammar and vocabulary is taught, because... Um, at, at sort of you know a beginner and elementary level you don't really learn um at the very beginning you know very intricate grammatical structures um what you learn is uh blocks of language phrases so like you know you'll go through i don't know whatever book it is let's say english file elementary um you know verb phrases you'll learn buy a newspaper um you know give a present run a race um, this, these like common verb phrases and then you'll learn how to put them into questions and you'll learn how to make them positive negative but you don't really you know s some some people will ask well why is it a newspaper why not the newspaper I'm like, no, no 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 don't don't worry about that we'll talk about that later just for now just learn the phrase buy a newspaper cook dinner celebrate Christmas whatever verb phrase it is and then later on we'll worry about the intricacies um Similarly, at CPE, obviously here, you, you know, you know the intricacies of the grammar inside and out, but still what you're learning at, you know, the higher and higher you get, even advanced, to be honest, you're, you're learning more blocks of language, all of these collocations, um, common phrases, idioms. Okay, it's, it's about learning blocks of languages as opposed to, you know, individual structures, because you know the structures already. But then in the middle, this sort of pre-intermediate, upper-intermediate, um, uncanny valley. Uh, oh, uncanny valley, that's a phrase I taught in my in my class of the day. So if anyone's listening, then there you go. That's how you use that phrase. Um, so you've got this uncanny valley in the middle um, where you're, you're learning a lot of grammar and you're learning the sort of, you know, the, the, the base, what would you call it, source code of um of of how you create these structures um but then yeah well, once you get up to as i say that advanced level you sort of realize you you know all the grammar and now it's a case of learning 
um, these sort of set phrases, collocations and, and grammar and vocabulary kind of blend into one mush, I, I tend to find. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, I absolutely agree uh, with you there. So that's probably what kind of puts me off studying grammar and the theory the tab because like being a proficient student, proficiency student, I realized that, oh, I know grammar. What's the point in learning it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I opened the book and they show some examples or some cases of using, I don't know, present continuous, for instance, that I probably have never thought before, but still I know some basics. And I don't know, I don't, I'm not the kind of a person who likes to get down the neat and gritty. Uh, I know those people who really want to, uh, who really like opening the book and just look at the very example of using every tense here, yeah, just are. Um, analyzing it yeah wondering why is it so yeah but maybe I thought I'm a little bit thought from it and just more like skipping something yeah knowing that yeah I don't need it but probably uh when I have some more time I don't know I will just get back to it get back to it and well, no, learn I, I, it in every detail yeah I, th I think you're right I mean I obviously it's hard for me to comment on English, because you know, I, I I hadn't learned English as a foreign language, but certainly when when I'm, you know, if I'm ever these days, if I'm ever surprised by something that I read in Russian, it's not it's not grammar. Uh, I'm not surprised by anything in terms of grammar because you know, obviously, may, maybe I don't read enough. I don't know. Pride cometh before a fall, as they say. But you know, I I think there's there's not really much more I could learn from from a Russian grammar book. Um, however, when it comes to vocabulary or different phrases, I'm all, all the time I'm taken off guard by, oh my, I didn't know you could use that word like that. Oh my God, I've never heard of that word. So it's, it's vocabulary and not only vocabulary, but collocations and, and how the words are combined in different ways. That's what surprises you um, once, you've, uh, once you've gone through all of the grammar book. Yeah, but I just know that at this very probable stage, you have to do nothing but just learning by heart and yeah, sometimes you cannot even provide any kind of explanation and I'm also like you said asked by my students why in this very example we have to put it like that yeah and when it comes to very very advanced grammar <laughs> I just feel like that's even like out of depth and I, I don't know why I just yeah I have to open the book or google the question because yeah mm -hmm. so there were some tiny things that probably even the proficiency student don't proficient student don't know it yeah Unless but, you just I mean, I, look it up. But being honest about it, don't, I mean, I think advanced and proficiency students would know better than to ask the question why. Why is a very silly question. Why is the worst question you can ask in an English class, don't you think? Mm, you mean we have to, um, uh, how should it be asked then? Like, if it's, it's not, well, you mean uh, the question asked by the student, yeah? So well, probably it should be paraphrased not even paraphrase just abandon that way of thinking don't even think mm. about asking why it's because when you ask why the the implication is that language was designed not evolved the but i think sometimes it makes sense so there are some cases when you can ex kind of explain why it's that just because it was like something or so it has to do with some historical roots and yeah yeah sure. but there are some examples that probably have some our explanation that's probably what you have to do yeah, um, I think it depends on the question probably on the problem mm -hmm. yeah absolutely no I, I I accept your your correction um wh what I mean is when people ask why when the answer must be by definition completely arbitrary for so the classic example is countable uncountable when mm -hmm. when they say for example um you know potatoes in English why in Russian, kartofel is, is uncountable. So why is it that? Oh, I say, uh, because if you say it differently, you will make a mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go, go ahead and yeah. say, say it how you want, but I'm telling you how it how is the correct way. So yeah, that, yeah. I mean, that kind yeah. of question, that's a silly question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, but students do not always understand that it's a silly question because probably they think that there should be some rule uh, which that can be applied and mm -hmm. that helps to identify and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, tell between the uh, this count yeah. uncountable things. So, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's because people make a, a logical mistake here. People think that countable and uncountable must map on to the real world, but it it, it doesn't. 
it never mm -hmm. does it's it's almost entirely arbitrary now there is some sort of you know correspondence in that for example liquids by and large are almost always uncountable there are some exceptions but liquids are almost always uncountable and things which are kind of small units of things are normally countable but it's almost entirely arbitrary and you know that because there are words which are synonyms for the same thing one is countable one is uncountable for example you could say shoes or you could say footwear they both describe exactly the same object and uh, you could say the same in russian you could say you know uh krasovki whatever the word is and then you could say obush. one is countable one's uncountable and they describe exactly the same thing but the at any time, if, if I have like an elementary student who said, well, that's not logical, as if English is obliged to be logical, which it's not. Um, they say, well, that's not logical. It should be countable logically or it should be uncountable logically. I only have one answer. She. Think about that. Plural <laughs> soup. That is insane. <laughs> Pripravok sham. For, you know, yeah. what are you thinking? Plural soup. Um, so that's just an example of how you know, countable, uncountable doesn't always need to make logical sense, as indeed the entire language doesn't. I think it's due to discrepancy that exists between English and Russian language. And yeah, especially these elementary students, even pre intermediate and intermediate students, like translating every word or translating even the whole sentence from Russian logic uh, into English logic. And I, I see that that's probably, that, that's not probably, that's what you don't have to do because. Otherwise, the sentence itself will not be grammatically correct, yeah? so, because the order is a little bit different in every sentence. Like, uh, in, like in, in Russian, we, we do not necessarily have to start with the subject, while in English, it's usually required. Yeah? And, mm -hmm. Always, yeah. always. Well, no, not always required, but it's a subject lead yeah. language. Yeah, mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. must have a subject yeah. somewhere, yeah, if not yeah. at the beginning. Um, yeah, I, 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 I partially agree with you, but I think there's, I think there's something deeper here. Because you say, like, you know, translate from English language logic into Russian logic. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, we, you know, we, we, de so we definitely don't think in language. Um, but ultimately, there's, there's a layer, there's a universal mental language which all humans have to the extent that, you know, as, as um, the, the great um, um, cognitive um, psychologist Stephen Pinker, who I'm a huge fan of, he, he put it in, um, in what was it now? Uh, was it The Language Instinct? I think it was one of his books. Um, he said that if aliens came down onto the planet Earth, they would think that we all spoke one language because to us, they seem very, very different. But if you, at some level of analysis, our languages vary so little that we might as well be speaking the same language. They have such common themes that um, our languages are almost identical. We're just, you know, our brains can't um, interpret them quickly enough. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if it's, if it's um, about, the, I don't know if it's only about discrepancies though, because I think so sometimes a student can, can have um, trouble accepting a grammatical principle, even though it works in exactly the same way in Russian. So an, an example would be, um, so someone, someone asks me, for example, um, so let, let's say future continuous for, for future events, yeah? Like elementary, mm -hmm. pre-intermediate stuff. Um, you know, so tomorrow uh, we are leaving at eight o'clock. And they said, what the hell, present continuous? I thought that was for, you know, for, for continuous actions in the present. I say, well, it's the same in Russian. There's no, you know, you can say, you know, how would you say in Russian, we're leaving at eight, eight o'clock tomorrow? So it's after we eat him, voice him, or we mm -hmm. Oh yeah, of course, there's no difference in that. But still, even though it works in the same in Russian, tenses as well, people get confused with past continuous, but you can say like, you know, um, you know, I, I left the house yesterday at eight o'clock, you know, so, you know, or you can say, I was leaving, no mm -hmm. difference. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Yes, yeah, sometimes no. it helps. Translating helps. I, I, I agree with you there. Although there are those who are against translating at all, but yeah, it can save the day <laughs> mm. sometimes. What, and what, there is yeah, no, no need just to give just like very long explanations. Yeah, it's, it's way easier to just say a new word in Russian and yeah, a student will realize what you're talking about.
maybe. maybe. Or mm -hmm. even just translating the sentence like you were talking about, yeah. Yeah. What's, what, what do you think the, the problem is there? Why, why are some people against translation? No, I, we know this uh, methodology, uh, like communicative approach, yes, and which is quite a widespread nowadays. And we are told every time that uh, the whole process of studying English should be English, English, not English, Russian. And maybe it's kind of a stereotypical thing that so people probably think that or the more English you speak during the lesson, the more effective it is, and probably it makes sense to uh, make a person understand something using only English. Like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe like will provide us more deeper knowledge, that student with deeper knowledge, but I don't know, it's really strange. And I, I know that some people nowadays are moving for, away from that, that trend. And uh, at least so those uh, teachers that I know, sometimes they can speak Russian during the, language, during the lesson and, mm -hmm. you know, probably even to save time. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, well, I don't know, what's your take on that? Why, is, why are so many people opposed to the idea of translating? Because in my age, like when I was like 15, 14, we had a teacher who, was, who spoke English perfectly and he was a perfect teacher too, but he was never against the idea of translating. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've never even thought that under no circumstances should he translate something. But that's what I've recently heard that, yeah, that's a bad idea. And, if you do it, it means that you're not like a professional teacher. It means that you cannot speak English well yourself. So mm -hmm. I don't know where it comes from. So um, to, to answer your question, what, what do I think? Um, so three things. Um, first of all, if so, let's think about the situations when it's certainly not appropriate to translate. If you are if you are practicing speaking, I would definitely recommend against resorting to your um, native language in the class um not not you know religiously but certainly you know as as my friend anton always puts it when you're speaking your brain needs to understand it doesn't have a plan b you need to say this in english or not say it <laughs> preferably find a way of saying it um so that's the first thing um secondly when it comes to these grammatical explanations, you are, yeah, you're certainly right. Sometimes it is much simpler just to translate. A and if the distinction also exists one-to-one -one in Russian, then yeah, why wouldn't you translate? Of course, that, that's a sensible way of doing it. However, uh, so if you take that, so take the example we had earlier um, with, you know, if you say, um, you know, ya uh, pashol versus ya shol, like continuous versus um, a perfective um, well that's kind of problematic because if you then are to tell a student that um, any continuous tense is just like in Russian and any um, simple past tenses is uh, like well that's problematic especially when you get to negatives in Russian because in Russian that that gets a lot more complicated to say like you know when you make the verb negative then it it, get, it gets very um, so. For example, you could say like "я не читал эту книгу" or "я не прочитал." So that that they have two completely different meanings, and that distinction does not exist at all in in English. Um, to say that you know I, I haven't read that book in general, or you know I was reading that book and then I never got to the end of it. Um, of course, then you know wh when you when you start teaching perfect tenses, then maybe you might want to use that example. But you see what I mean? You, un unless it it corresponds one to one with the distinction in Russian, then I'd say it's a bad idea when it comes to grammar. However, the elephant in the room, as they say, is this um, communicative method. Um, the first of all, did, did I detect a little bit of skepticism towards the communicative method in in your voice, or am I imagining? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm not against the communicative method and I think that that's really what helps at least a student to speak and I'm using now this, uh, my favorite book, at least with adults, those who are not preparing for exams in English file and I think that, that that's the book which is based on this communicative approach and with that book our students speak well, at least they know how to do that and yeah, and I applied during the lesson, so I applied this communicative approach, although sometimes I can speak a little bit Russian, at least, for example, if a student asks me to provide some word, like, I don't know how to say Vashni, um, for instance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, a student can try to explain me, I want to say 
you know, this maybe provides some situation, but we can spend like 10 or 15 minutes. So it's easier to see just how to see Vashni. Yeah, and I'll just immediately give, give the words. I, I think it can be done uh, in, uh, in uh, favor of saving time. So that's what, where we have to do. It definitely it shouldn't be used like on a regular basis because I think that otherwise students uh, get laid back, uh, get, uh, laid be, uh, get lazier a little bit, yeah, because you mm -hmm. know that every time they can just ask you or speak with you in English, and that's probably what doesn't help them to keep in shape, you know? mm -hmm. So using English can really help you, like, uh, not, not, or if the requirement of using English can help you not to toe this line, yeah. You know? like, mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know, no, I'm not against communicative approach, but I think that sometimes probably we shouldn't be so strict uh, with regard to using Russian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've even had one situation in the group. I, I remember I published some word, uh, the word with Russian translation, and there were those participants who voiced their concerns over that, saying that what on earth are you providing us with something Russian? I said, but don't you think that if I provide you with the Russian definition, it means that you can understand the term perfectly well. And it works uh, for me too. Like sometimes I can't use English Russian dictionary uh, if I don't, for instance, understand the meaning which is given in English. And if I see how it sounds in English or in, in Russian, mm -hmm. uh, there is a guarantee that I will use it one day because I will have this are, you know, kind of um, association with Russian language. And it means that there will be the day when I probably just come back to that word, I uh, cast my mind back to that definition given in Russian and I can apply it. And it happens, it happens, yeah. Because anyway, I'm a Russian person. I mean, like uh, Russian is my native language and mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where are you from, by the way? Which city are you based in? Um, basically, I'm from Siberia, Krasnoyarsk, but I've been living in Moscow like for 10 years already. Yeah. Oh, nice. So, oh, yeah, a, um, mm -hmm. a, a fellow <laughs> Siberian. You, wow, Krasnoyarsk, that's, uh, that's pretty northern, very cold. How cold does the winter get there? Um, the winter gets like 30 degrees, but sometimes we can have 35, but I would say that again, it's a kind of a stereotypical thing, like, uh, because sometimes minus 10 in Moscow equals minus 35 in Krasnoyarsk because of this high level of humidity that yeah. we have here in Moscow. So. Yeah, it's, it was exactly this in, in Chimin, exactly the same. And in uh, I, I used to work for a short time as well in uh, Nizhny Vartovsk, which is obviously, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's quite the same climate as Krasnoyarsk, but it's, you know, well, I mean, once you get colder than minus 25, then, you know, it feels the same. It, there's no difference. You just die more quickly. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no, there's no hiding from that cold. You can have all the expensive winter coats you want and wrap up the best you can, but it's not going to help. <laughs> it's not going to help. I know I like winter, but I like normal winter, not like Moscow winter, like winter with snow and yeah, uh, sometimes I tell people that winter is my favorite season, like like this minus 30 degrees with loads of snow in the trees and people do, do, do not understand how can it be. Like, but I, I was born in Siberia. I remember those, uh, the, the time when we gathered with my friends, play snowball. So though it was like minus 20, but still, mm -hmm. yeah, we were so happy, blissfully happy. But of course what, it has nothing the, to do with Moscow in Moscow, with weather in your... Moscow. Temperature for Akirovka in in Krasnoyarsk. Uh, for what? Sorry. Well, Akirovka. So you know when when they when they close the schools. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Oh, minus thirty. I remember there was a difference between primary school and secondary school. So for mm. primary school, it was like minus thirty for secondary thirty five. Yeah, and I yeah we had one winter when it was like minus forty. Probably in all schools were closed. Yeah. Jesus. We were waiting every time in the morning. We were waiting for this weather forecast, yeah, before, to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before um, going to school. And when it was like minus 33, not minus 35, yeah, mm -hmm. we were the, 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 the saddest kids, kids in the workers. Yeah, our parents didn't tell us uh, that we it's, just have it's, to it's go it's to school. Policy as well, because I don't know what the government is thinking when they close the schools. 
where do you think the children go? Children go straight outside and they go and play in the street. That's what yeah. they do. <laughs> uh, and they're all going out and they're, you know, yeah. they're going, playing on slides, you know, um, and um, sledging and making snowmen or whatever. Um, so yeah, better to keep the schools open, let them in, I say. <laughs> But yeah, we didn't need to worry. And what about the what, what about the temperature like in Nizhny Vartemsk, like when students were allowed not to go to school? Um, I can't remember because don't forget that Nizhny Vartemsk is it's um in um Khanchmansky Square to Nolny Okrug, so it has yeah, so it's different. the north. It, it yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's but, much but, colder. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in terms of legislation, it had more sort of mm. independent laws. So, for example, in mm. um, Chuming, under the uh, Chuminsk Oblast um, laws, for example, the schools would close at, I think it was 30, 30 I can't remember, 30. Um, and, and then in terms of alcohol laws, like you could only buy until nine o'clock or something like that. But then in uh, in Khmal, there were slightly different laws. So you could you could buy until 10 o'clock. And then I don't know what the temperature was for, for, um, for the schools closing. It didn't affect us as a language school because we were classified as this, um, um, this so it wasn't a, a federal school. It was this um, um, quite nice designation called uh, Chuda. Have you heard that? So you know how like they have these company prefixes. It could be like you know, uh, or 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 something. Oh, like yeah, 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 yeah. It was. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what the hell did it stand for? Частное учреждение дополнительного образования. It stood for. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't know if it was a joke, <laughs> but you know they're they're quite quite funny um, company prefixes. Um, but sorry, I didn't I didn't even answer your question about the communicative uh, method. So here's uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was talking about like coming out, or uh, yeah, I was telling you that story in the group that it was about pu publishing some word in Russian, uh, yeah, yeah, definition in Russian, yeah. So, yeah. do you think that sometimes it can really help just to translate it in, in Russian? There is nothing wrong with that because by doing this, we can just probably help a student understand better the, 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 the very word. Don't For you think sure. so? As, as long as people remember that, you know, languages don't correspond one to one, which I think anyone who's studying for CAE should understand already. Otherwise, that you know, I don't know how they got to that level. Um, but the thing with the communicative method is um, that I think it, it's certainly it's it's useful and um, it's, it's a great way of learning and a great way of teaching. But it is also an invention of convenience. I think there's a lot of people in in the English language teaching industry um, who get some sort of TEFL certificate or CELTA and want to use this career as a means of traveling the world. And the communicative method is the perfect way of doing that. It's the perfect method of arriving in a country whose language you don't know, whose culture you might not understand, and to say, no, 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 I don't need to learn your language because we have the community method. Do you see what I mean? So it's, some, it's an mm -hmm. excuse for someone to not understand a word of Russian or to understand a word of Chinese or Arabic or whatever the native language is in your country that you're visiting. Mm -hmm. So you can have some common language that you can speak. For sure. I, I, yeah, I, I think, it's, I think it's, it's a way of, um, for native speakers to travel the world and not have any consequences if they don't understand anything about the language or culture. And I, I take that very seriously. And I, I, um, you know, as, as you know, of course, I, you know, I'm, um, my background is, is in studying Russian. So, I, uh, you know, I've always had a, a deep desire, um, to learn as much as I can about the Russian language and the Russian culture. Um, because I think you need to understand that in order to teach effectively in a Russian setting. Um, mm -hmm. Go on, go on, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I agree with you that probably you can do the trick if you're speaking about this moving somewhere abroad and provided that a person, like your student, doesn't speak your language, I mean, the Russian language, so that's definitely where it can, yeah, see if, see, see, uh, yeah, it help you tremendously. But if you're speaking about Russia, Russian students, so people who can't speak Russian and with whom you can't speak Russian, so maybe that's where we don't have to be hard, too harsh on them. If they want to speak a little bit of Russian in order probably to get the message across to you more effectively and 
Um, I also uh, sometimes I notice that uh, like <laughs> a student uh, who's in dire straits, or I mean, like uh, he he's really in trouble, yeah, because he cannot come up with some words, for instance, in English. And of course, they can do nothing but just help them. Mm. And of course, they can do nothing but just uh, help them uh, saying that, yeah, same is same Russian if you want. So it's not a problem, yeah. And mm -hmm. then so he can see or she can see mere symptoms in English or in Russian. And I think it will not spoil the lesson after all, just. Sure, sure. Okay. It's, um, it's also, it's, um, you get it with, with inexperienced teachers a lot of the time. If they don't speak um, the native language. So if you've got a teacher in class who's trying to teach them vocabulary, if you've got a, a group of quite confident students and a not very confident teacher, sometimes I've seen this happen before when I've been observing lessons, the students will, will correct the teacher and it should be the other way around, of course. So for example, this teacher, he was teaching um, film and movie vocabulary and he was teaching the word scenery. So scenery, as, as of course you know, means like the, um, the, how the film looks and where the film mm -hmm. takes place. And these students kept resisting and kept trying to say, so th that's like, it's like script, yeah? It's like the, the lines that the actors, and of course I understood they were thinking of the Russian with Tine. Mm -hmm. But that was, there was just a, a, a simple misunderstanding. And if that teacher had, you know, a, a basic knowledge of, of the words he was teaching in Russian, he would have corrected it like that. But in the end, he allowed the students to win and he said, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then, you know, he's now taught something which is incorrect. They have learned something which is not correct. Um, you know, who, who wins in that situation? Yeah, no one. so this misunderstanding can happen. And sometimes yeah. I have an event with my students. I remember we were learning a list of words. And after, uh, after that, I decided to test <laughs> my students' understanding because uh, during the whole lesson, I was trying to speak English. And then I just realized that it wasn't very effective because yeah, some of the words they learn correctly while other words they had to see problems with. And like you see, even this word, so not always can it be really easy to explain the difference between some words only in English, provided students are not of like an advanced level because mm -hmm. yeah. Still, they can have some problems with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there are definitely some cases where, um, you know, if you're learning the names of flowers or learning the names of herbs, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't really think it's a useful exercise to say, um, you know, parsley is a common uh, wide-leafed herb which is green and grows in temperate climates, which is often used in Russian and in English cooking. Petrushka. You're done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there's no need. It's a waste of time. Ha having said that, however, um, now I'm going to contradict myself. Um, it's very interesting. A lot of people take for granted the fact that when we, so for example, when we say salmon in English, um, or when we say tiongo or la in, in, in Russian, or farig is another example, like trout, um, we, we are referring to a huge group of different fish which are not necessarily related, um, or, or at least are, are not obviously related, not, not obviously part of the same family. And the members of that group in English or in Russian or in whatever language might be very different. Um, so that's really worth bearing in mind that um, things that we take for granted, like, you, you know, you can learn the word continent in, in Russian, but then a Russian's understanding of continent and an English person's understanding of continent are completely different. For example, obviously in Russian schools, we learn that Eurasia is one continent, mm -hmm. but we learn Europe and Asia. They're, they're just different, different ways of, of breaking up the world. Um, I suppose that's, um, that's an example of how learning language is not enough. You've got to speak to people. You've got to learn culture as well. Mm -hmm. Or like in community co approach, they are dealt with those pictures yeah, instead of just or given a definition, you could say we can just or give some pictures. So and with some English words and probably that's what will uh, help us not to use Russian language yeah, mm. so why not? because they can be different forms of how you can explain the vocabulary. For sure, for sure. All right, uh, Smijana, we've been going for about 50 minutes so um, I'd say that's, um, that's a pretty good time to, uh, mm. to wrap it up. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me and um, 
yeah, just um, behind the scenes information. We're actually taping this episode uh, on 1st of November, but um, I've got some more in the pipeline, so it's not going to come out for a while, but uh, that'll give us a chance to, uh, yeah, to, to talk it over and um, yeah, we'll, we'll plan where we're going to post it, who we're going to tell and all of that stuff. So thank you once again for joining. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.